recording. There you go. Um, this is our last class. Um, we were talking about maybe continuing it in one way or another, but as we get close to Passover, I always feel that it's very hard to do a class on the week of Passover. I also have a couple of events that I'll, I'm going to be doing next week. Um, and then once we get beyond Passover, we're into all kinds of things in the spring. But the main reason I thought this should be the last class, we've been going pretty consistently through from the high holidays, from the fall, all the way to now. And um, I think we've covered a good amount of the new Jewish canon. And enough so that, as I sort of mentioned last time, if we were to keep going, some of it would be repetitive. I, I've always felt, you know, you got to keep them wanting more. You got you to gotta leave them, you know, hoping for a little more, feeling maybe we, maybe we should have done more as opposed to we went one, two, one session too long. And that's sort of a rule of thumb for me, except, by the way, for with High Holiday Sermons. Then I, I, <laughs> I got to get it all out there. Uh, I don't care if you want more. All right. So, but for this class, I wanted to be sure that we covered some of the basics. Basically, what I'm talking about for me are, are the books that I felt have made the biggest difference in terms of my Jewish growth, but also my teaching and, and, and really, by extension, um, this congregation. So for this last session, um, we're taking a little bit more of a pragmatic perspective. We're not you know, going to talk about deep theology although there are some interesting points to be made, but more about um, pedagogy, more about education, educational theory, and the big changes that have occurred. You know, we, we could really ask two questions um, here. One would be how have services changed? When we've talked about that here and there during this course and prayer and all of that. And also how has Hebrew school changed? You know, the two prime functions, core functions of the um, typical mid 20th century synagogue that now is evolving faster than we know or totally understand, and maybe in some cases disappearing, but or reinventing itself at least. But a lot of it has to do with the, the, the way we pray, but also the tools of prayer, the books that we use, the prayer books. So I, I want to focus a little on the art scroll, Sidor, chapter, and then um, talk a little about Joseph Telushkin's book, as well as some of the other educational uh, books that are discussed. Um, the Jew versus Jew chapter, Samuel Friedman's book, that's just a really important book. Um, it doesn't quite fit in here, but it really does get, it, it helps us to summarize some of the things we've talked about, about some of the conflicts going on uh, in American Judaism today, and among American Jews today. But let's let's start with the prayer book because I think that's something we all have an opinion about. We always have an opinion about, and we've probably noticed the change. So I'm going to start by asking, and whether or not you've read the chapter, um, how has the experience of using a siddur changed for you over the last, you know, give or take half century, depending on how long you've really had an interest in it. Um, and, and the kinds of Sidors, the kinds of prayer books you've used, um, how have that, how have they changed? And uh, if you did read the chapter, then maybe um, you comment on what you think about the, the impact of Art Scroll, of all things, on all the movements and on all, of, on all, all Jews. So talk about your prayer experience and how, um, how it's changed. Could, if you can think back, go ahead, Sandy. Okay, I have on the table my copy of the prayer book that we now use at TBE. Yes. And I love this prayer book. I've loved it since we first switched over to it. The prior prayer book was quite interesting, but what I like about this, it gives you so much to focus in on as you're reading the Hebrew because the commentaries and the English verses, they really give you so much to think about and to interpret and mull over in your own manner. And one of the problems that I found growing up 
with the Sidhu ream that we used at my parents' synagogue, you, if you could read the Hebrew, you read the Hebrew. You have, didn't have a clue what it meant. It, you didn't have a clue what you were saying. You didn't understand the relevance. And so you really never felt, or I really never felt, connected with the TBE prayer books, especially the one before this one, and especially now this one, as well as the prayer book that we use for the High Holy Days. There is so much in it that is, you can make it your own. And I think because you can make it your own, you get meaning out of it. And as you get meaning and understanding, you look for more. That's my feeling about Thank these you. different That's prayer great, books. Great summary of, of what I think a lot of people feel. Eileen, did you have your hand up? Basically, we always had the English version that went with the Hebrew, so you could struggle along with that and try to pace yourself so you were in the same place. But the biggest difference I see is that there's so much more in this, this book. There's the explanations of what the prayers are and why you're doing them, and then there's the additional stuff to think about. And no matter how many times you read it, you keep finding something new. Okay. Anyone else? Um. Okay, so what's interesting is you probably won't even know the name of the prayer book that you first used um, when you were growing up. Silberman. Well, you know. <laughs> and actually, he was a rabbi in Hartford. So I think people in Connecticut know. We, we call it the Silverman. I mean, the rabbinical community would always call it the Silverman. I think most people grew up with it, and it says Sabbath and Festival prayer book. And it was the black prayer book. And I thought, oh, wow, this was so exciting. And around 1967, I think they came out with some blue covers. But it was basically the Silverman, and it had the Hebrew on one side and the English on the other side. And there were parts that even weren't in English. Um, it was primarily, you know, very basic Hebrew. Uh, Jeff, did you have your hand up? This is the one I got from my bar mitzvah. Okay, wait. I have. I've got to put you on uh, speaker view here. Can you? Can you? Say, uh, hold on. I'm gonna spotlight you. All right. So that. Is that yeah, it's a down? little bit. Uh, I think that's the boxer, or the. Um, Is Phillips? Uh, yeah, it's. It, it's either the boxer or it, they're related, um, and that was a more. A more detailed interesting it had some commentary the silverman prayer book has no commentary and this was an actually an orthodox uh prayer book i believe at least in its origin so this this one had no commentary Burnbaum. that's a burn bomb uh prayer book right does it say it, philip burn um yeah it just says phillips oh okay it means it, Phil, no, philip owned it no, he wrote no his name commentary, in no book. directions it just Hebrew and English and yep. barely a paragraph. Just the facts, ma'am. So, you know, it, it, what's interesting is people didn't complain because they didn't know that there is something better. They didn't know that there is something potentially different or it didn't matter to them. So you can look at it both ways. In like, for instance, the Maxwell House Sidur, which <laughs> is, I mean, the Maxwell House Haggadah, which is um, sort of the the, the analogy to, of, of Passover to Shabbat and festivals is that Haggadah to some of the new Haggadahs that we have out now that are just all over the map and very specific to different interest groups, filled with commentary, with stories. You know, all the Maxwell House Haggadah had was English, Hebrew, and wine stains and a little piece of matzah in there somewhere. But People didn't complain about that. People liked it, in fact. The idea of a prayer of a service back in the 30s, 40s, 50s was perhaps to get to the Kiddush. I mean, that's, I think, always been the case for a lot of people. But everyone was there. You know, there were lots and lots of people at services. So it was really a just, it was the social event of being at services, singing together, davening together. The Hebrew literacy interesting that you mentioned that sandy because i think i think your generation i think those went to services you know back in that period 
understood Hebrew on a much higher level, or at least could read Hebrew at a much higher level. So there was no need to have transliteration. That's a word I don't even remember seeing, you know, English letters of Hebrew words. Um, I, I didn't see that until like the 70s. So that the prayer books didn't need to do what they do now, but at some point they started to change. And it was uh, ironically the Orthodox who made the change. It was Art Scroll. Eileen? You're, uh, you're muted. Rabbi Goldman put together what we call the brown, the big brown book, which yes. had transliterations of all the prayers that you needed to be able to join in on. And he put together some other stuff too. It made the service a lot longer because every time we gave page numbers, we had to give the brown prayer book. In the brown, numbers. no, he called it the larger prayer book. I remember, uh, yeah. And, uh, and, yeah, and they're still around. Oh, they are because we, we somewhere in the library. Gotta bury them. I mean, they're they're prayer books, um, but yeah, but I think that was actually very innovative for its time, and on and its time was long before I got here because I think at yeah. that point there was no choice. You had no transliteration, so much more accessible to at least be able to read in English letters what everyone else was reading in Hebrew. What Hagada? What Hagada do you use Friday night for the first night? Oh, the for the, well, you know, we'll we'll be leading it, so you'll you'll see. I mean, I've been using the different night for like twenty years, the the red one, or it has a white version that's um that's older and uh, larger. But the mm -hmm. red one, we used it our temple seders uh, back in the early two thousands too. And it's funny; it's twenty years old. It's probably dated, but I still find it to be a nice combination um, of good explanations, supplementary readings. You know, it has songs like if I had a hammer, you know, <laughs> to give it a social justice feel, let my people go. But at the same time, you know, it has the traditional uh, Haggadah. I don't know why people use Maxwell House, frankly. I, I never liked it. We always used the red and yellow one growing up, which was basically one level above Maxwell House, but at least was a little more attractive. I, it's you know the problem with Maxwell House, which we've had Noam Zion, who wrote the um, that different night Haggadah, um, came here as a scholar in residence once, and he talked about how it did such a disservice because it made people believe that the Haggadah was in a fixed form, that it wasn't meant to evolve over time, to change over time, and and that everyone had to read every word in order to get to the food. <laughs> And okay, so you go around and you have Uncle Joe, you know, say trying to figure out how to say omnipotent. And, you know, you got Rabbi Jose, you know, Rabbi Yossi, um, some relative would mispronounce that. And you sort of go around the table and, and it becomes very boring. And, you know, it's very literal. And I think that's the sign of a of a civilization in decline, in a way, where you get stuck. That, that I think also happened to the conservative movement in a way. It was orthodoxy that made the switch to the art scroll Sidur. And why? Because actually in the mid century and you know, onto the 60s and 70s, orthodoxy was so small, everyone thought it was gonna disappear. <laughs> it was shrinking dramatically after the Holocaust. It's very hard to maintain um, such strict beliefs. Also, America was not a place that had very uh, compact communities where Jews could live and not have to drive. And Jews were moving out of the inner city for reasons good and not so good, um, moving away from urban areas. And so the suburbs were not a great place for orthodoxy to thrive. Plus, so many, especially among Hasidic groups, were killed in the Holocaust. I and mean, it was, you know, so many. Anyway, so we have Art Scroll sort of coming up out of nowhere, um, 1984, which is is not that long ago, and changing dramatically how people looked at the prayer book. You can see what they did. They they had nice um, design. The Hebrew is very easy to follow. You've got notes. Look at this for the Baruch Hu. Bend the knees at Baruch, bow at Ata, straighten up at Adonai. Now you have to be able to read 
those Hebrew words, Baruch, Ata, and Adonai. That's sort of interesting. They assume that degree of Hebrew literacy, but nowhere in the conservative movement did they ever instruct people how to bow for the Baruchu or the Alenu for that matter, things that we do all the time. So, and then they have nice little commentaries, not historical commentaries, because they're not gonna be into that. But, you know, the Talmud talks about, this is actually, I'm sorry, this isn't the Baruch Hu, it's the Amida. So it's how you bow for the first blessing of the Amida. Um, Baruch Ata Adonai, you know, you bend down and up. So that you're looking straight ahead when you get to God's name. So here the, the Shema talks, gives it, I mean, sorry, the Shema. The uh, commentary gives us an introduction to the Amida here with some nice notes. The patriarchs, of course, they don't have the matriarchs. Our new prayer books added the matriarchs in the um, 80s and 90s. And here, this is the English side. So it does say, blessed you and Hashem. And, you know, it doesn't spell it out in Hebrew there. And it does have an English side. And the Hebrew side is on the left and the English side is on the right. Um, you had the reform movement creating prayer books where, you know, would be the opposite, would read like an English book. Um, so the, the kind of prayer book you have really um, tells you a lot. It teaches a lot without having to, you know, to bang us over the head with it. You see no, you see contemporary language here. Blessed are you, Hashem. Know these and thou's. First thing we got rid of was the King's English and in the conservative movement, I think still in the Silverman, um, there were these and thous. It was there were lots of these and thous. The Silverman was uh, copyrighted, I think, 1946, 45. It was 48. It was around then the original, and the High Holiday Silverman um, was very similar to the Shabbat and Festival one, and we used it at Temple Bethel until 1992 give or take 19 uh, when did i start eileen 87 yeah i know but i was assistant rabbi. oh 892 no i mean I, so i'm trying to make a point here when you get a new rabbi that's when you, you can do new, new things it's a lot easier to you know to make that huge jump but we made a two generation jump actually it was with the shabbat prayer book because high holidays you have to buy 2000 copies it's you can't do that overnight that had to, we had to build up to that but um for shabbat we changed it right away because we could not live <laughs> with a prayer book that was totally irrelevant even if we had supplements i you know i did supplements too but you need to be able to open the book and and, and it needs to be meaningful by then by the 90s we had to do that so the silverman doesn't even mention the Holocaust. It doesn't know that the state of Israel exists. It's 1946, 47, and there were new printed editions, but new printings um, after that. But you know, of course, it's it's not. So how can you have a Jewish anything, a service certainly, without recognition of that the Holocaust happened and that Israel um, exists. So um, that was why we needed to change prayer books very quickly. But it's not inertia. It's not, and, and there's no one to blame. It, it's because people love tradition. You don't want to make a change like a prayer book. It's, it's a really hard change to make. So that's why, you know, the new kid in town got a new prayer book. But in the meantime, we've gotten used to it. So when Lev Shalem came out, we were one of the first to get it. When um, the new Chumash came out in 2000, Eitz Chaim, we were one of the first to get that because we were really ready to get beyond the Hertz Chumash, which again had a lot of these and thous and their explanations were not great. But now we're, we've, we've gone beyond that. Now, I'm, now we are almost to the point where things are individualized so that you can create your own Sidur. And that's talked about in um, 
in in the reading. So let me see if I can find that. Hmm. Whereas previous American cedarim had existed largely in relation to and for the sake of synagogue worship, the art scroll cedar was designed as a largely self-contained volume suitable for synagogues, but accessible even to those with little prior knowledge of the liturgy, studying its pages in isolation. This accessibility was achieved through a clever combination of text and design. Um, let me just go on to the next page. So now we have smaller scale publications have been far more daring. We have so many new prayer books. They're exploding off the presses. Um, the realm of feminist and queer positive publications, Sidur Nashim, Women's Sidur, published in 1976 by undergraduates at Brown University. I said that on purpose because I, I was there. I did not have anything to do with the publication of this prayer book, but I knew the women who were doing it, and it was very creative and very radical. And then, you know, it, it mentions a lot of other brand new prayer books, especially um, with gender issues in mind, but also with new concepts of Zionism and of um, Jewish inclusivity, multi-ethnic inclusivity, God's gender. <laughs> you have the whole issue of, of seeing God not as a he or a she. Uh, all of these things have become fascinating. So if I can, hold on one second. So uh, this is mentioned actually in, in the chapter. This is a website called Ritual Well. I'm just going to try to move things around so I can see what I'm looking at here. All right. So you can all see it. So you can come up with your own prayers. Let's say you know, you're having a hard time healing. You got the Corona prayers, um, healing services, lots of interesting stuff. Um, everyday holiness, life cycles. So interesting. let's just say death and mourning, because that's something we all have to deal with and we all have. Um, these are rituals that have been created for dealing with death and mourning. So this is a, a kavanah, a meditation for Yizkor. El Malay Rachamim, you know, that's the prayer for the dead we use, for victims of climate change. A Kaddish for 2020, which of course was the first big year of Corona virus. Um, memorial prayer for miscarriage, stillbirth and baby loss. I mean, there's so much here out of, uh, here's the, Prayer for lighting the Shiva candle. And I often recommend this website for people. But um, so everything has become very personalized. And if you don't wait, someone I, I haven't checked the chat. I'm sorry. Okay, that was from a while ago, I think. Okay. All right. So um, here's another. This is called the Open Cedar Project. And you can Google these and you'll find it very easily. So let's say you want to mix and match to put together, you know, your own prayer book and you can pray on your own. There's no reason you have to always be in a minion. In fact, you can pray in a minion, but use your own prayer book. We've had people are one of our um, cantors does that. Uh, anyway. So here are just here are some new things that have just yeah. been added recently. A midrashic addition to Dayenu. This was put in one day ago. Um, then we have things his, of historical importance. Blessing on the Festival of Napoleon from 1806. But um, so let's say you want to put your Sidur together. National Tax Day. Anyone want to do a prayer for National Tax Day? Let, yeah, I should <laughs> check that out. Kavanah for paying taxes. I actually wrote one of those once. I felt that you should say a blessing when you, because if taxes are being used correctly, which is a whole question, but if they are, then you are saving lives. You could be saving, you know, helping Ukraine right now, saving democracy through our taxes. Um, taxes are, you know, a blessing that we, we can 
share in our, our society if, if it's okay. I mean, if it's done non-corruptly. Here I sit ready to pay my taxes and invest in this community's future. I believe that government can make lives better. Okay, there's a little ideology there. We can solve problems together that none of us can solve alone. We need clean air, clean water, healthy communities to thrive. And then it sort of goes down the laundry list of, you know, things that government does for us. Prayer is meant to raise our consciousness. And I think it does that beautifully. All right, let me go to, so let's say, you know, you're just playing around here. This is what I did with a Mm-hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Compiled prayer books. Liturgical prayer books. So these are the Sidurim, okay? Sidurim, Shabbat Sidurim. So you want to find a prayer book for Shabbat. How about Mari for the Sabbath evening according to the ancient Persian rite? You click on that, it's right there for you. Um, this is now here's something from uh, this is much more contemporary from 2020. Shabbat supplement by Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shlomi, who's of course the great leader, the guru in a sense of um, of renewal Judaism. This one I, I, I thought you might be interested in, a Friday night prayer book dedicated in honor of Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> there you go. And this was, this was put together um, because it, uh, there was a science a, fiction convention in Boston and they needed to, to daven to do a Friday night service because who's going to go to a science fiction <laughs> convention in Boston? A lot of Jews. So they they put this together and then sent it to the Open Sidur project. So you know, I'll just show you. You click on it. This was uh, it's been up there for was about. Was he a five Kohen years. or did he just use that? What symbolism? Was oh, he, he a was, Kohen? It's a Kohen. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely. So here we got it right here, and I'll just show you the first page. Maybe I'll show you the second. I'll show you a random page. <laughs> and this is um, from Kabbalah Shabbat. It is just a traditional prayer book, but beautifully laid out, by the way. Much nicer, I think, even than uh, Lev Shalem in terms of the readability. Has the Hebrew on the right and the English on the left. Some, some do it the opposite way because your eye is naturally gravitating toward the middle, both English and Hebrew, but it has both the transliteration and the English translation on the same column, in the same column. So it's it's very readable. What you need, of course, is to bring your, you know, your uh, cell phone to the service or your pat your tablet. I mean, you could print it out, I suppose. But who does that? You know, <laughs> or you can you make you make a PDF. You just click on that, and then you can just go down. Anyway, so if we had unlimited time, I mean, you could see that it wasn't that hard to find Sidorim, but you, you're really looking, you have to know what you're looking for, because um, there's a whole lot of other stuff here, including creative prayers. So I'll, I'll stop there for a second. Any comments? Yes, Sandy. Question. Yeah. What is renewal Judaism? That's a new term for me. Okay, renewal Judaism is not a movement per se, but it definitely is closest to conservative and reconstructionist. It is based on the thinkings of this Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shlomi, who was an sort of a self imposed exile from Hasidic Judaism, from Chabad especially. And he started something that we really call neo-Hasidism, which is Hasidism for progressive Jews. So it's Hasidism without the strict Orthodox adherence to Orthodox practice, um, focusing much more on mysticism and on Hasidic uh, legend, uh, Hasidic teachings, um, but also his own teachings, and, and with, with a, a definite touch of Eastern religion. So, you know, the people is it, went, 
he, he was on the group. He was in the group that went to see the Dalai Lama. We talked about that book a few weeks ago. He was in that group, and he belonged in that group. He was the one who could relate to the Dalai Lama like they were two old friends, just having a show. Is, so is that group of, of Jews, is that to the left of conservative? I think and, it's, it's hard to... So that you, you're making a great point, and you don't even know you're making it. Because this comes into Jew versus Jew, where um, the, uh, Samuel Friedman, who wrote that, talked about how the conflicts among Jews now are much more based, and even since he wrote the book, much more than that, than he wrote, on politics, on Israel. You know, Israel now divides American Jews, where it used to be the focus of bringing us together. But religion doesn't so much divide us anymore. I mean, there, there are definitely differences, especially in women's rights, etc. But you have this sort of combination. You have a synthesis going on. You have so many different um, you know, in, inclusions. People marry one another from different denominations. Reform Judaism has gotten a little closer to tradition. Orthodoxy has sort of reached out. They now have women rabbis. So it's, I can't say what's left and right. It, it's to the left in the sense that it is philosophically very progressive, politically very progressive. Sandy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, mute again. Sorry, is that little, little it's interference? Hurt. It's to the left in that sense, but it's not to the left in terms of ritual because um, Zalman Shakhtar Shlomi would keep Shabbat, would keep Kashrut. He would call it Echo Kashrut because it's Kashrut also with real concern for the environment and the implications for animal rights, et cetera. So it's not, you know, for the same reasons, but it's, it, it is tradition. So that's the left, right. Okay. So yes, Roz. I was going to say just what you discussed. I'm sure it's hard to create a Siddur, but when my children were young, I created the Haggadah. And as they grew, I added to it and I put more relevance. Just today I read it and I have a page that I discussed things like you discussed, like the Warsaw Ghetto. And, and today I added about Ukraine and about the pandemic. So when we get together to read our, our Haggadah, it will be to the moment. And it, it has been very good. When the kids were young, I had like little plays. And now that they're, you know, even my grandchildren are grown up, we have more serious discussion. And it's been a really good thing because I look at it every year and I change according to what I think about Judaism and about the age of the people involved. Yeah, and there, um, I, I think on that open sea door site, there are Haggadahs, so you could create your own. Okay. Um, but there also is a site called Haggadahs Are Us. And, uh, and that's where a different night comes from. And I think they oh. did a little bit of, uh, or at least they, during the pandemic, they sort of relaxed some of their copyright standards and allowed people to mix and match and create their own Haggadahs. I don't know that it's possible to do it this year. Um, well, what I did was yeah. just purchase a bunch of Haggadahs at the time, and then I just cut and pasted and created it my, myself. Yeah, yeah, we're old fashioned. That's, <laughs> you know, Bye. how much paper uh -huh. I have wasted in my life, and it's mm -hmm. primarily Temple Bethel's tab, <laughs> but putting together all of these booklets, <laughs> yeah. you know, and now we just throw them on the screen. And, I know. And it's, you know, it's so much easier and it's easier to cut and paste, but we don't really mean cutting and pasting. We mean cut and paste on the online and, uh, and putting together a really attractive Haggadah. So but I would not like my whole family to sit with their tablets at our Seda table reading the Haggadah. There's something about that, that just. Yeah, you know. I know, I know. And that's one reason why um, newspapers still exist, especially right. in the Orthodox world because Shabbat is still prime newspaper reading time. But I think we're heading there. I mm -hmm. hate to say it. I mean, I think COVID sort of kicked us over the edge. Um, you know, I, I never would have expected to have, you know, laptops involved in leading a service. And we're still debating on how to do that in person, but we've certainly been doing it on Zoom 
um, and very successfully for the last two years. So I think we're, you know, I think we're net, we've passed that point. And I, you know, and for my kids who are already elder statesmen in their late twenties, um, no problem for them to, uh, to look at the world through, through their tablets. Jonathan? One thing I wish the Sidur would offer would be a better entry into why we pray in a particular prayer, maybe with a set of questions, maybe with a parable that sets the, the emotional and emotional context, obviously the more than one emotional context, but just something to sort of prompt you. I mean, because the, the innovations you're talking about are great at explaining the prayer and explaining maybe the past context, but to to be personal is a, is a real challenge still. Some of them do. Hmm. Um, I think Lev Shalem comes pretty close in, in terms of all the ones we've used. And, you know, I've written supplements too that have focused in on that. Um, I, I sort of aim high and, and I'm not sure it's the best way to go. It's just what I like to do because I'm really, um, you know, I'm a very intellectual. I'm not saying I yeah. am, am an intellectual, but I'm thinking yeah. about the world in a very intellectual way. Whereas hmm. Art Scroll, it just says, this is how you do it. This is how you bow. And and you know what? There's something so alluring about that because it doesn't talk down to people. Anyone can access it. Someone who's got a PhD from Oxford, you know, still might be uncertain about how to how to behave in a in a synagogue. You know, right to left, left to right, what do I do? Um and then and the person who is a total stranger will feel the same way. So, I mean, I, I, I don't, Art Scroll is not telling you the whys, except for some very simple whys. Like, yes, we do the Shema here because it follows naturally after this prayer here. You know, it doesn't say we do the Shema here because we want to declare that God is one and what does unity mean and what does it mean to say that God is one and all, you know, it, it doesn't get into that, I don't, I don't believe to that degree. So, um, but you know, I, I hope that this at least has helped you and helped us to understand just how profound the changes have been. And that's been sort of a running theme for this whole class. I mean, I, <laughs> I whenever I, whenever I finish, you know, I it, like whatever, eight o'clock, I'll, I'll turn off my computer and I'll go, oh my God, what has happened? <laughs> <laughs> you snap your fingers and suddenly the world has changed so dramatically. Um, and, and we see it in no greater sense than there with, with the ways that we pray. But let's talk for a few minutes about how we learn. Um, there, there are several, uh, several books that are mentioned here. One, I'll just very briefly say Jonathan Sarna's work on Jewish history, um, history of American Judaism, is a very important book. It came out right at the time of the 350th anniversary of um, Jews um, in America. And, uh, you know, some of you might know he's, I grew up with him. He's a personal friend. He's spoken here a few times and he's just an incredible guy. But what came out in this, um, in this chapter is something that comes out every time you hear him speak. He's a profound optimist. And if you read American Jewish history, even, even all the tragedies of European Jewish history, there is something optimistic about the fact that we're still here. <laughs> because especially with American Jewish history, which doesn't have a Holocaust, you know, it ha we've had anti-Semitism, but we haven't had to deal with anything remotely close to that. Um, but every generation, Everyone's saying we're disappearing. It's the last generation. There's no continuity. You know, we're going to be gone in five generations or less. And he said, you know, and he quoted other teachers, and it's in um, it's in the packet. Um, a nation dying for thousands of years. <laughs> we are a nation that for thousands of years we just keep dying. That means we're a living nation. 
Our incessant dying means uninterrupted living, rising, standing up, beginning anew. And because you know history, Jonathan Sarna, because he knows history so well, he, when he came here, he spoke about 1850s, 1890s, but before the big wave of immigration, you know, from Russia, Eastern Europe. And then, of course, more recently, every time you have these people, he showed chapter and verse where people, rabbis, were getting up there and saying, um, we're, we're, we're dying. <laughs> we're not going to survive. We have to change fast or we're done. And he said that the Jewish continuity crisis basically is continuous. <laughs> you know, it's just discontinuity, in fact, that is the crisis, because what's happening is that thing, dr change, dramatic changes are happening, and we just don't have the faith that we can adapt. And yet somehow we do. So um, that's a very profoundly optimistic way of looking at life. And I think that's that is a reflection also of American Judaism. I think there's a real optimism to uh, what we do. And that leads to much more experimentation that has to do with our democracy as well. It's a can-do spirit when you don't spend half of the time hiding from the police, you know, and, and worrying about whether you're actually going to survive. Um, you can do some creative things and all the things we see going on now, all the things that I've been bemoaning, oh my God, things are changing so fast. That's what's going to save us. We just don't know how. So that's Jonathan Sarna. And I don't know if anyone has any comments to make based on that chapter. Um, and he also, you know, I think democracy has a lot to do with American Judaism. That's why it's very hard to transport it even to Israel, which is, has a very different experience of democracy over there. And, um, and of course, they're a Jewish state. It's a whole different place. But they haven't been able to accept conservative and reformed Judaism and pluralism and, a, you know, having no church state separation there, synagogue state, um, means they have to have an official religion. They have to pick one. And so they pick Judaism and they pick Orthodox Judaism. So that's Sarna. Okay. Now we have, um, I, I mentioned Jew versus Jew. I'd like to focus for the end on, um, on the, uh, the three writings. They're, one is a huge book. The other are pamphlets or articles. Um, Telushkin's book. Anyone who has taken an introduction to Judaism class with me has been in a bar, an adult B'nai Mitzvah class here over the last 25 years, um, or who's converted to Judaism with me, has used that as, as the basic textbook, has taken any Judaism 101 class that I've given. Ever since he wrote that book, Jewish Literacy, I've seen it as um, just an incredible tool of resource. So for that reason alone, it has had a profound impact on American Judaism. I'm not talking about because I've taught that many people. I'm talking about how so many rabbis have agreed with me and have used Telushkin's book as the standard for determining, even defining what is, what are the basics? What, what should every American Jew learn in order to be a literate Jew? And um, so the, the chapter here asks some important questions that maybe we you know, haven't been critical enough of that. Um, for instance, it doesn't, Telushkin is modern Orthodox, very accessible, very much a man of the world. He's spoken here also several times. Um, he's very accepting, really focused on ethics, but, but it's not, the book is, has very little about ethics. It's a nice menschlichkeit uh, chapter, but it's really about history, nuts and bolts, holidays, you know, Shabbat, Kashrut, high holidays, you know, it, it's, it doesn't talk about feminism at all. That's mentioned in the essay. Now, again, he's modern Orthodox. It may not have been that important to him, but you'd think that at a time when it has become the defining difference among the Jewish movements in America, you know, we allow women to do so many. Oh, that's a horrible thing to say. We allow the conservative movement and reform Judaism have for a long time had an egalitarian standpoint in terms of men and women and gender. And now we're really 
understanding the fluidity as well. Uh, orthodoxy has been slow to come along, but it also has done much more. But so anyway, Telushkin doesn't doesn't deal with that at all. And that was one of the interesting things. Does someone have a question or? Okay, there was something in the chat. I, I, oh, Rabbi. Yes, go ahead. I, I was going to ask sort of as a last question in the course, where do you personally see us going? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we can go a little over if uh, if you want. So I know it's 7.57 right now, but if you need to be somewhere, obviously. Um, Heidi asked a question about the different night Haggadah. I just want to get that out there. Um, we have not discussed giving them out. I don't think we would have any problem doing that, but I'm planning to share it on the screen. Now, I understand that you might have a bunch of people at your table, it may make more sense. So um, let me look into that. I think there's no reason we can't let people borrow them as we have in the past. We just need to have them returned because whenever, you know, God willing, someday we'll have a congregational Seder again, we'll need them. But um, so Heidi, <laughs> remind me offline, okay? Where do we think it's going? Ha, huh. Heidi, do you want to tell us where you think it's going? You, you're uh, um, muted. Did you want going to say back to, going back to the chat? How does that compare to the compact edition of um, different, different night? night? The, it's the red one that is compact. Oh, yeah. The, there's a white one that has more pages, but um, like you know, it has a whole section on the four children as depicted in art. And it's really interesting. It, it shows really the, the sort of the history of how it evolved in America over the last hundred years um, in cartoons and, and beautiful works of art. In the 1920s, the evil son, the wicked son is depicted as a boxer because um, a lot of Jews were into boxing at that time. And it was seen as like, that's what, you know, Moishala, who's not a nice kid, he'll end up doing instead of going to Talmud Torah and becoming a rabbi or even better a doctor but you know he became a boxer so that was the evil son anyway so that yeah um that that's in, i think that's actually in the red one too all right um go ahead sandy you can answer the question what well first question just to sort of link up to what you were saying about democracy and Judaism as a religion, for someone that might be interested last evening, the Bennett Center for Judaism, the Quick Center in um, Fairfield, had Sydney Lipney for um, their guest speaker. And she spoke for over an hour about her view of Israel, its past and its future. And if anyone wants to hear a really, really interesting dialogue I would highly recommend it. Oh, I, I love that city live me. Yeah, I was, wanted to know how that went. I heard about it. So can you see something on the screen now? Yeah. All right, so this is Vanessa Oaks. She's also a, an amazing scholar. And while Telushkin talks about sort of, you know, what does it mean to be a literate yeah. Jew? And in, in terms of knowledge, <laughs> content, um, this is her idea of what does it mean to be a, a, a literate Jew um, in terms of values, ethics. What are the <laughs> values that every American <laughs> Jew must learn? Every Jew, forget about American Jew, the sensibilities as she puts it. So she says here, making distinctions. Havdalah means making distinctions. Um, calendar, vacation time, family time, birthdays, whatever. Two, honor, kavod. We are aware that we do not live in a social vacuum. We have to, we want to be respected and we want to respect others. Turning, to teshuva. We believe it is possible to reflect upon one's life, turn it around and experience forgiveness from others while feeling a sense of renewal for ourselves. Interesting that she doesn't talk about the concrete ways it's manifested in Judaism, meaning the high holidays just talks about teshuva as a concept, as a value concept. Dignity, being in the image of God, selam Elohim, another value concept. Saving a life, number five, pikuach nefesh, 
being a really good person. Amensh. Number six, keeping the peace, shalom by it, repairing the world, tikkun olam, maintaining hope, yesh tikva, and remembering our ancestors, zechut avot. These sensibilities can help Jews formulate decisions in keeping with one's Jewish compass in at least three particular areas. And then she says healthcare, ritual practice, personal, moral choice. That's a very different approach. Let's see, I need to get back to you. Very different moral, uh, a very different approach from Telushkin's, which is moral. You know, I mean, with, hers is moral and, and value centric. Telushkin's is fact centric. To be an educated Jew means to know what to fill in are, to know why milk and meat are separated. Um, and for her, she's saying we have to preserve life, which is one of the reasons for kashrut, to preserve the sanctity of life in a more values centric way. And then the other little essay that's talked about in that section by Paula Hyman, who was a um, who's a uh, JTS professor, she gets to um, Hebrew, Hebrew language. That's a core essential component of a basic Jewish education, recognition of Hebrew language. So I, mean, I, I could put it out there and ask you, what should be the core curriculum or the prime focus of Jewish education today? And I would say Hebrew school, but I think Hebrew school now is, is very, very different from the way it was when I was growing up. Um, and when it was primarily content based, and it was a lot of it was rote. And I really learned how to read Hebrew and I really learned the prayers, but and they really scared me about the Holocaust. But um, it wasn't, you know, fun. <laughs> And now the goal of Hebrew school in about one tenth the amount of time that we had back when I was going to Hebrew school and where it's seen now as a um, as an optional activity rather than a compulsory education, a supplementary education. It's now basically less than gymnastics. Um, which isn't to put gymnastics down. It's just that's where the priorities are for American Jews. So, you know, that notwithstanding, now it's much more values oriented. It's about they should have fun, they should feel good about being Jewish, and they should come out of it saying, I just love being a Jew, and maybe we'll throw in a little trip to Israel or something. So they really love connect with the Jewish people. Uh, so, you know, we, we've changed so much in that sense, too. And I'm not sure we're keeping up. Um, I'm not sure we're changing fast enough to uh to preserve jewish education there's a real as optimistic as jonathan sarna may be um just because we've always managed um the real concern i have is with jewish literacy and that the next generation is uh, non-orthodox is not really learning they, mm -hmm. they don't have enough to have being a jew in their kishkas mm -hmm. you know and i'm not just talking about pre-bar mitzvah it needs to go well into high school years for that to happen. And if you don't know what kishkas are, then you have an education issue. <laughs> gut, <laughs> gut level Judaism. So I mean, I'll give a little more of an answer to that, um, Tertians, in just a second. But Evan. It's just a comment and a question. Uh, first, thank you again so much for all of this. Um, you talk about optimism um, in prayer and learning. And it goes back and now coming up on 12 years to our very early meetings that your optimistic approach was so um, uh, so deeply felt right from the beginning. It meant so much to us. And it's not something that I had experience with in synagogue growing up. It was a fairly rigid, I grew up in an Orthodox synagogue and I was not necessarily attached to that approach. And uh, it, it, it has transitioned me personally uh, tremendously over these 12 years. So for that, um, gratitude. Uh, my question is, as a new rabbi, I wonder how you grappled with bringing modernity into a prayer book where I couldn't have imagined such a thing growing up as you alluded to 
with older traditional prayer books. How were you able to do such a thing? Well, you know, I think it's because I was already there. Um, first of all, Evan, thank you so much. Thank you. And, and you know, it, it's, it, it goes both ways. And I'm talking to everyone in this class and really by extension to, you know, the whole congregation. It's, it's getting to know people like you and your stories and um, incredible stories of how, what, what brought you on your journeys to this place that has helped give me the strength to understand that um, we're doing this for a good reason. We're doing this for a purpose. And, and it's going to lead to something that will make the world a little better once we've left it than when we found it for the Jewish people, um, you know, to see the look in people's eyes when they see Israel for the first time, or um, even when they go to Auschwitz for the first time to see that, that connection they, they make to one another and to the Jewish people and or to Barbados for the first time, Evan, <laughs> um, where your wonderful wedding was. Uh, so we, we, you know, thank you, but, we, but it's shared. It's thank shared. You. So anyway, I was there already. And so I had an, I had a, an advantage. Um, you know, my, my history, my, my um, story is, is having grown up in, in a very traditional conservative congregation in Boston that was that never uh, never relented from it. You know, my father was a traditional cantor, but he had a little spirit of Hasidism in him, a little bit of the rebel in him too. So he smiled when I, as a teenager, got up at our junior congregation service and said, you know, this is a little bit of a show here. We got to be more authentic or whatever. And the rabbi got really mad at me. So, um, you know, <laughs> I was already there. It was very traditional, but I was living in the midst of the counterculture. And in Boston, Boston was, I don't like to use the expression these days, but ground zero of the counterculture. Um, very traditional synagogue, but the Hebrew school was run by a, a group of experimental educators from Brandeis who were rewriting the book and who had been, who are part, were part of the Chavura, the Chavura Shalom, the Jewish fellowship group that really changed a whole lot. They wrote the Jewish catalog um, in Somerville and in Cambridge and, you know, the People's Republic of Cambridge. So, uh, so change and maybe that little radical side was already in me and I was able to, to come into a more traditional setting, but I wouldn't have come to a more traditional synagogue than this. And this was not a traditional synagogue in lots of ways. Um, this was one of the few in the conservative movement that had was different enough to be able to be open to change. And, you know, we see that. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, yeah, really radical. I was I was back there yesterday. I went to visit my brother. I tried to get up there once a month. So I was in Brookline and it's just great to walk around. You know, I can tell you, maybe I should turn off the tape. It's like Coolidge Corner is the bluest corner of the bluest town in the bluest <laughs> state. <laughs> so I could just be who I am, you know. Um, when you s just take a step out onto the street, the main street from a crosswalk, red light, green light, doesn't matter. Every car stops. The pedestrian rules. <laughs> no one disobeys that. It's uh, it's great empowerment of the individual. Anyway, um, so enough ranting. <laughs> uh, Jeff, I don't know, maybe I should ask you that question. Where do you think it's heading? It's hard to say. I mean, there's, uh, and, and certainly I don't, you know, based on this class and the course, none of us would have predicted where we are now 15 or 20 years ago. I mean, it, the, the change has been so thorough and, and quick. Um, and I think positive, but it, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I was expecting any kind of answer, but um, it, yeah, I think it's, you gave it's gonna be interesting to find out. You gave my answer. <laughs> okay. You know what, I think there's so much that we could never have predicted. And, and this book has helped me to understand that because 
I look back, I mean, all these books are still in my library. I haven't read a number of them in for years, but now I realize, yeah, you know, it's true. On, on the negative side, we never would have expected Israel to be a a, a, a place of, of separation, um, especially for uh, American political parties, you know, Republican, Democrat, Israel was a consensus issue. Jews all over the map all thought of Israel as sort of the unifying factor. And right now it's it's not. And we I think we can build it back to that, but it's going to take an awful lot of honesty, um, which I don't necessarily see out there right now, um, an effort to make it happen. I, you know, two years ago, I was worried that NATO wasn't going to exist. And now, you know, I think America can shine a light of democracy for the world once again, for horrible reasons. But um, so things changed dramatically in the last month. So who knows what's going to happen over the next 15 years. Michelle? Yeah, hi. Um, I think from the readings that we've in this book that we've done this you know, part of what's been like an academic year. Um, and from if, and for the people in this class and the people I know in my synagogue, those who are, take the time, there's, it's very encouraging. There's so much discussion going on. There's so many good things being written and such a great variety of views. And I think more ideas out there about how to educate, how to lead your life, how to share things that are Jewish than have ever been out there before. But I think unfortunately, we're a small subset <laughs> of the larger Jewish world, both here and in Europe and Latin America. Israel's a different situation. And I think there's also a real big disconnect from what I've been reading between Jews in the diaspora and, Jew and Israeli Jews and harder and harder to make those connections um, that we actually live in our own bubbles. And I think that's really hard. So on the one hand, it's really optimistic because there's so much good material out there and so many people like at the Heart Mission are trying to make things work and get and have education at all levels for all types of people, that that's really positive and exciting. And on the other hand, sometimes I think it's not broad enough. And also there are so many, so many demanding important issues on our time right now and challenges. Right. I mean, the, so the, that, it's, it is such a paradox that we have the most opportunity to make connections than ever in human history. There is nothing that's keeping Americans and is American Jews and Israelis from having extensive conversation in real time. You know, we could barely write an aerogram when I was in, in Israel for the year, and it took two weeks for me to send a message that would get to my parents in, in Boston. Um, now, you know, you could just WhatsApp and you're you're right there. Same thing with education. I mean. It, how can you not be optimistic when each of you basically has in your pocket more Jewish education than is in my entire library, in fact, of the entire library of every rabbi forever, you know? So this is, this is the last site that I will show you. I, you know, we showed you uh, Ritual Well before, and, um, and, and this is Safaria. This is an incredible tool. All the books I have in my wall, <laughs> Bible, Talmud, Jewish law, Hasidic thought, mystical thought, Jewish legends, stories. The only thing it really doesn't have here much is um, like modern literature, because I think they're copyright issues. You know, you can't have Saul Bellow here or Philip Roth or Zionism, you know, a lot of Zionist literature, but that, that's elsewhere. So safaria.org. You want to find out something? And I, people on Shabbat mornings have seen me do this. You go to, so you can see, I clicked on Tanakh. This is the Bible. Book of Genesis. We got the whole Bible here. We got the whole Bible here. Prophets, the writings. And then here are translations of the Bible into Aramaic called Targum. And here are commentaries, but it's even easier. So let's say... Now, this week's portion is about leprosy. We don't need to do that one. Let's say Genesis 1, in the beginning. Oh, let's say it's just, you know, all you want is the English. Okay, you can just have the English. 
let's say the size isn't right. You want it bigger, you want it smaller, you want it just Hebrew. Let's get back to Hebrew English. You don't like the layout. All right, you know that, so it doesn't matter. Um, when God began to create heaven and earth, Rashid bara Elohim and Shemaim that are you click on that, you get 431 commentaries, 28 references in the Bible, 136 um, locations in Midrash. You have sheets by Jewish educators. Let's just take a look at the you know, great verses of Torah. <laughs> I mean, there, there are so many. I, I, but let, all right, let's say Rashi. He's like the big, the big gun. 1100s, great commentator. So, Bray Sheet, first word, in the beginning. And you have different commentaries about that. You need to do a little bit of brushing up on who's who, on who these guys are. Ibn Ezra, Ramban, he's very verbose. Um, That's why they got but, to the Torah. You know, there you go. You've got every possibility. All right, so that, is, if you want to read the Talmud, it's nice to do Daf Yomi, by the way. And here, here's today's page, the, the page of the day. So if you want to have Hebrew and English, I mean, it doesn't look like it does on the page of the Talmud. It's a little nicer to be able to see it, you know, from a Talmudic page, but you have it sort of laid out in such a way that it's fairly understandable. In marriage, what does that mean? Oh yeah, yeah, anyway, <laughs> a Leverite marriage is, <laughs> It's um, it, it, it's basically there are certain kinds of marriages like if someone dies you get to marry, you know the brother, in order to keep the family's name going. I, I, I'm just that that's an arbitrary page, a random page that I chose. But there's Talmud, Mishnah is you know based on Talmud work, Midrash, legend, Kabbalah, Jewish thought, liturgy. This actually is like the Sidur Open Sidur project. Oh, so here we have Haggadahs. Right. Different Haggadah comic. These are more traditional Haggadahs, but there are several different high holidays, Machsors, and then melodies, um, Pew Team. So you can download them and listen to them. There's just so much here. It's miraculous, more than any rabbi has ever had combined. Um, and there it is, you know, that doesn't mean that everyone is learning on his own or her own, but it is possible. So that, that's one reason to be optimistic. It is possible. Evan, did you have your hand up? Just a last brief comment on where we're going. You speak about the paradox and the paradox, uh, part of it with regard to information, the, yes, the blessing of our time can be access to information. The curse of our time is wide, easy access to misinformation. And the way we handle that conflict will largely determine where we go and how we get there. And how we're going to do that is an open question. That's, that is so important. You know, in a way, I mean, it's sort of evolved. It's, it's, it, it wasn't my intent, but, um, I've seen my role as rabbi evolve into gatekeeper. And, you know, I, I, more people read my, you know, Shabbatogram or at least open it. I mean, I don't think anyone actually read, I don't read it all the way through, but more people open it than all of our adult ed classes and services combined. I mean, it's about 800 from the congregation Amazing. who open it every week, seven to 800. And then people share, it. you know, that's like unique open. And so I find that what I need to do is put out there for people. These are the articles I think are good, that, not so much that agree with my opinion, but that I think are, 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 they pass through the gatekeeper, you know, they pass through the filter that is not false news. And that gives you fake news, that gives you a little bit of a balance and a little understanding and maybe a little insight into the weekly portion and you know all that stuff and um and then let's talk about it i mean and, and this is my way of reaching out to people people often you know reply either reacting to that or asking me 
you know, how to kosher their dishes for Passover or whatever. But so I think that it, you, you are now going to depend on your rabbis, religious leaders, to some extent, political leaders, since newspapers have really fallen by the wayside, except for the big ones, um, to be that filter, to help people determine what's truth and what's not, and then to inject values into it, Jewish values, which I you know, try to do all the time by taking news events and sort of uh, putting them in the context. So complicated to do that and attempt to be um, apolitical simultaneously must be such a challenge can't <laughs> it's you know but, but that's i mean that's a lesson i learned long ago you you just you you want to be there you want to be accessible to everyone and you want to be open and um you, you want people to know that there there are strongly held values um that translate into what's going on in the world and that's how religion is supposed to you know interact with the world at the same time um you know i'm just a a country pastor and and i need to be there for you no matter what you believe or what i believe you know at those times you know as, as part of the research um with jonathan sarna's book you'll see it but also i i as you might have you might notice I, I I love to look at old newspapers. There's a journalist in me, and I, I big history buff. So if you go back to the 20s and 30s, um, newspapers would cover rabbis' sermons. Um, in the Sunday papers, you would read this rabbi spoke about da 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 da. This in the newspaper, and it, well, especially like in the 1940s when Israel was created, um, New York Times. The day after Israel's creation, you can go to Times Machine if you're a subscriber to the Times, and you can look at the papers from that day. And what the rabbis said was important. I'm not saying it's not important now. I'm think you know what, what I do. That's I think is important is is what I put online. But what I do on a Friday night is less important. It's really meant to help people feel good about having reached Shabbat alive. You know. But but it um, but on in 1948, the week of Israel's creation, they got they got summaries of all the sermons that the rabbis of New York gave about Israel, and they were political. <laughs> so th that's what we should be. We should just be a, a political in a Jewish sense. Anyway, but great comments, great questions. Um, I really enjoyed this class. It's really it's been just so exciting and and i think it is the right time to uh, call it a night and to call it a semester um and i, I appreciate you, hartman Rabbi. i appreciate hartman for for putting that book together and i'll look for more courses like it for uh, the future thank you thank, okay. you. thank you all thank you. and i am recording i'm stopping it now so that's something